so much for spending one of your last uh, precious hours of the conference here with me. You guys have spent the past couple days uh, in intense learning, networking, uh, workshopping, designing. So now we're going to kind of change the focus. You guys are going to get to learn about UX through a different lens. So that's what we're going to do. Um, what I aim to do with this presentation is parallel my experiences working with the Smithsonian. I was there for two years. I worked in education and outreach for the National, National Museum of American History. So I'm going to kind of parallel those experiences uh, with what you do every day as user experience designers. So I hope that that's what you guys take away from it, that the work that you do is extremely important. I'm new to UX, so now I'm doing it. And just kind of show you that there are people out there doing it every day just a little bit differently. So just to tell you guys a little bit about me, uh, I worked with the Smithsonian for two years, and after my contract ended, I was kind of at a crossroads where I had to decide what I wanted to do. And I said, okay, I can either continue on that path or I can go back to my design roots. So one of the first things I did was I started talking to my friends and my family about what I should do next. And of course, when people are trying to help, they might ask you some questions that are very terrifying. And one of the first ones was people said, uh, well, what are you good at? And I said, okay, that's a bit of a hard question. And after taking the scenic route, from after college, I kind of said, you know, I had all these vast experiences and had worked in buying. I got my degree from Drexel in design, so I'd worked for a buyer for a little bit and I ended up at a museum, so I kind of had this winding path a little bit. So then I said, you know what I'm really good at? Putting myself in other people's shoes. And of course, everybody says this is not a real job. If you look this up on Bureau of Labor <laughs> Statistics, this is not going to exist in there at all. So I said, I'm pretty sure there's somebody out here that gets paid to put themselves in other people's shoes. So I eventually found a home in UX. And that's what you guys do every day. You have to be compassionate. You have to be out of the box thinkers. You have to be creative when you come up with personas and, and everything that you do. So now we're going to get started. The Smithsonian Institution um, is composed of about uh, 19 museums and the National Zoo. I worked specifically at the uh, National Museum of American History, and I worked for the Limelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation. And their main mission um, was to educate the museum public about the process of invention. So essentially, excuse me, what they wanted to do was to teach you that anybody could be an inventor. That there, of course, we have people in science like Tesla, Edison, all these people that we hold up and we know that they've done great things, but people are doing great things every day. And there's a process that they use to get to that point. And you have that eureka moment, even if you're working in your garage workshop and you just need to make up a contraption that keeps the doggy door closed. You're an inventor. You're creating things. So that's really what they wanted to get across. So they had two hands-on museum spaces. One was Invention at Play and the other was Spark Lab. Invention at Play, um, we had like a windsurfer in there so you could learn about the process to uh, create different types of um, windsurfers that you use if you went um, you know, out on the water. They had things on um, uh, Bell and his work with um, a sound and stuff. So, and also at Spark Lab, which was really awesome, uh, it, it was like almost like kind of like a scientific lab bench setup. We had a, a team of really great docents that were um, had backgrounds in science. We had people that used to work for Exxon Mobil, used to work for the Department of Defense. And every day as a facilitator, which is what I did, I would engage museum visitors in educational programming. So we would do things with the Leiden jar, which is where you have everybody stand in a circle. One person holds the light, Leiden jar, another person touches it, everybody gets a crazy electrical shock. You have people screaming and having a great time and different things like that. Um, so that's what we would do at Spark Lab. So our space actually got about 30 to 40,000 people a month. And I was one of the managers for this space. So I had to open and close it, take care of all the docents that came in the space. In addition to, um, we had a daily schedule of activities that we did. So I talked about the mission earlier. Um, we had a really great development team at the Limelson Center. The team was made up of historians, um, curatorial staff. We had persons that were educational specialists, and their whole uh, you know, mission and goal was to make whatever 
you experience at the Smithsonian, it resonate with you. It teach you about the uh, mission of the space. So that's what they dedicated their time to. And even though I was just an educational aide and facilitator, they actually charged me with coming up with some really great programs and activities that we got to do in the space. Um, so the different types of educational programming we had, um, has anybody been to National Museum of American History lately? Raise your hand. Okay, and what did you see while you were there? Yes. Uh, anybody else? Been to the museum? Like, yes. Great. Anybody else see something really awesome there? Okay. So those are all examples of educational programming. If you went to the museum and someone was pushing a museum cart around and you might see the docents pushing the cart and they might have things on it like Civil War inks and different pens that you would use during that time. That's educational programming. If you came into the space and you saw me there and I'd be in my lab coat and I'd be working with dry ice and teaching people about sublimation, that's educational programming. So those are all the things that go into crafting a really great user experience when you come to the museum. So now I just have a few pictures so you guys get an idea of what the space looked like. Um, this was what a typical day looked like in Spark Lab. We had um, this area right here. You see a table has all these little blocks on it. We would actually, it was called soundscapes, and we would have kids learn about structural engineering. And they would actually build all these bridges, and it was like kind of like these Rube Goldman like con contraptions, and um, it had bells on it, and marbles, and all these crazy things. And then the next group of kids would knock it all over to the dismay of the kids that just left, and they would build something for themselves. And then we also have. Um, Right here was our lab bench area. We actually had a full lab in the back where we had um, chemicals like bromothymol blue. We kept our dry ice back there. We kept all our safety goggles over here. So it was definitely quite the experience. Um, and you see we have a diverse museum audience that would come in. We had this gentleman right here who looks like he's going about his very important business all the way up to, uh, you see we have all the parents in here, so we had just a vast array of people that would come into the space every day. Um, see this guy right here? He's working very hard. We would have different things. Um, we had a wind tunnel where kids could actually build an apparatus that would fly. So it was just a fan turned upside down and it shot all the air up and it had a little, um, we just put like tubing around it. So when the kids would make their apparatus, they would put it in and it would shoot out and you wouldn't believe that kids would stay there for like 45 minutes with the same little contraption and it's just shooting everywhere. And parents were like, I am so happy I have 45 minutes to myself after being dragged through this museum. So that was some things that we did. We also uh, had different initiatives within the Smithsonian. So at one point we had a robotics week, we had nanotechnology week, and if you guys are familiar with DARPA, we got Robbie the Robot. We had that for three months. So that was an amazing experience. We actually had uh, the DARPA team come up. They set up uh, all of the uh, different things for us. They brought Robbie in. We had to go through a training because he was a very expensive piece of machinery and we were told repeatedly not to break it <laughs> or we would have to buy it. So <laughs> we treated him very gingerly. And uh, this is him right here. You can actually see him at the Air and Space Museum. He's over there. And um, some of the things that he would do, um, you guys are familiar with eye tracking in UX. He would actually, if you held up an orange ball and moved it in front of him, his head would turn. And if you're familiar with the childhood game uh, Simon, with the lights flashing and you're trying to match the pattern, you could actually play that with him. You can kind of see it uh, in this picture right here. So kids would actually move the ball and his arm would move with you and then you could move it down and he would press the different buttons. So that was a really great experience to teach kids about uh, what they're doing with robotics now and it got them uh, really interested and it was really exciting for me. So that's one of my uh, more amazing experiences I had while I was there. And uh, here's one of our lovely docents we had. Her name was Libby, and she's teaching kids about uh, dry ice. If you've ever gone to a Halloween party and you saw that fog all roaming around on the floor billowing out, that was dry ice, which is just frozen carbon dioxide. So you see the kids 
future scientists right here all wearing their goggles and they would get to um, we would make big soap bubbles and it was crazy kids loved it and you can see him he loves it he is so excited right there the joy of a child so that's what I got to see every day when I worked in the space it was a lot of hard work but as you can see it was extremely rewarding so what is the UX comparison to all that you've seen? That was all a product that a development team came together and made. You all make things every day, whether you're making a web platform, you're making a mobile app, you're working on something, you're taking on a client. So that's the, the similarity between what we did in that space and what you guys do every day. And it's the creation phase. You've made your product. So now we're going to talk a little bit about visitor needs. Since I told you we got about 30 to 40,000 people a month, we would get a very diverse museum public. So this also included persons with disabilities. So we had to account for persons that needed wheelchair accessibility, persons that may have been visually or hearing impaired. So we had to make all of the programming within the space available to them. Perfect example of that is when I was talking about the dry ice, that's a very visual element that goes into dry ice. You're seeing it kind of bubble up and it fall over. Well, Visitor Services actually brought me a couple that was visually impaired and they had their service dog. So I had to, on the fly, right then and there, as a responsive designer in the space, make that applicable and accessible to them. So what I actually had them do was run their hands and they could actually feel the condensation, the coolness from the dry ice, they got to feel the fog. So I had to make that experience for them. So I had to take something that was normally geared towards being very visual experience and make make it for them. So like I said, our audience, we would get tourists. We're down on the mall. We would get people whose maybe their first language wasn't English. We would get newborns. We had an under five zone for parents to come with their babies. So we had babies in the space all the way up to octogenarians, grandparents being dragged around the museum that would come to our space. We had to make sure that no matter what age you were, you could come in there and find something that you wanted to do. And that's not easy. Group size. Sometimes it was a trickle of people that came into the space, especially if it was while everyone was in school, it's winter time, nobody wants to be out. You wouldn't believe how many people go to the museums on Thanksgiving and the day before Christmas. They're getting all out of the house while people prepare the food, they need something to do, and it would be a madhouse while I, we were there. We also had different symposiums and different things that were going on. I mean, July 4th, I mean, we would have to close the door. That's how many people we got inside the space. So we would have to make certain accommodations for them. Time constraints. So since a lot of the people we got were tourists coming into the space, that meant that they only maybe had 5, 10, 15 minutes to spend within the space, and then they were on to the next thing. They were going to see Star Spangled Banner, they were going to the Air and Space Museum, they were going to the Hershorn, they were traveling all over the city. So that meant that the programming that we developed in the space, it could be for one to two minutes, or it could be for 30 minutes to an hour. So every day that I was in there, I had to gauge my audience, and parents would say, we only have five minutes while we're in here, can you, can you just make it short for us? And I would just make a soap bubble, and it would, kind of explode and the kids would say yay and then they would just run off to the next thing <laughs> or sometimes I would have a school group of kids and they're all at the lab bench saying I you know, we want to do this I want to put the goggles on I want to knock stuff over and I'm trying to calm everybody down and they'd be with us for 30 or 45 minutes so I had to kind of spread that out for them so every day the docents myself and the other people that worked in this space had to make these types of accommodations so you're definitely staying agile staying on your feet um, while you're in the space. Safety, another issue. Like I said, that it was a lab. We required that anybody that sat at the lab bench had to put on goggles. Um, we had to make sure that the chemicals were sep uh, kept separately in the back away from the museum public. We also had Erlenmeyer flask, which if you know, they're very fragile and children are machines that are just meant to destroy usually whatever they come in contact with. So we had to make sure that they, we kept that space safe for them. So we had to explain to them about why chemicals, you can't touch them, you can't touch, you know, put them in your mouth, you have to keep your hands away from your face. Don't, you know, only do something when I tell you guys to go to the next step. So those are all considerations um, we had to keep in mind and really be cognizant of, especially with the dry ice, it's frozen carbon dioxide. We had to tell kids, if you want that hand, keep it off the dry ice. So they did listen to us, which was good. 
So what are the UX comparisons for that phase? So if you're familiar with 508 compliance with making websites accessible to persons with disabilities, that's very similar to what we would do in our space, making sure that person, anybody that came in the space, it was accessible to them. Target market. So while we knew that our audience was vast, we had to make so many accommodations for anybody that came into our space. With the target market, whenever you're doing all your work, you have to think about who's coming to this mobile site. Who is coming to this website? Who is using this platform that I'm developing? You'd have to make all those types of considerations. That's when you'd have to do your personas. You'd have to do all your research. You'd have to look at who's coming to the website and what platforms they're using to make sure that your coding or your development is in sync with that. So when I talked about our attendance levels and how many people talk about your web traffic, how many people come into the, uh, your website. You have to take all that into, into consideration as well. Attention span, I mentioned time constraints earlier, how you would only have five or 10 minutes maybe in the museum space. When people come to your website, they might say, I'm a busy mom and I have five minutes and I need to find whatever I need to find right now while you know, my kids are indisposed. They don't want to come and have to dig through your website. They want shallow, very clear hierarchy. They want to be able to find information very quickly. One of the great examples I saw was um, we did it at the UXPA's uh, one day workshop. We did an exercise uh, with the FEMA. We did card sorting. And we had to uh, kind of sort and group and arrange all the content so that if you were going through an emergency, you could find information extremely quickly because that's usually when people use that website. Most people just don't go to the FEMA site. Something has to happen before you can go to the site. If it's a storm that's coming, maybe you need information on insurance and different issues like that. So just keeping in mind when somebody's coming to your website, do they have a lot of time to kind of uh, delegate to being on your site? Can they really be that committed or do they have to get in and get out? So like when I talked about safety uh, in the Spark Lab, you have to think about safety on your website. If the website you're working with uh, or the mobile site uh, has an e-commerce component, you have to worry about data encryption and keeping people safe while they're using it and all their sensitive materials. So tweaking, so like I said, we got different people that came in every day. We had to be cognizant of that, which meant that we had to make changes consistently all the time, every day was a new day. When you walk in the door, you're judging how many people are coming in, what docents came in that day, what special uh, programs are going on in the museum, and it's so you're just constantly always adjusting everything. So with that said, we wanted to make sure that there was clarity. We wanted to make sure that when you came into our museum space, if you walked in, you said, I'm, I'm gonna learn something about maybe science or physics, and that's what I'm going to do while I'm in here. So you always have to keep that in mind that whatever you're working with, is it clear? Is it easily understood? You're not necessarily dumbing it down for people, but you're just making it that everybody understands it. Accessibility, like the issues I just brought up earlier, you're always making sure that anything that you create is accessible to people. Usability. So does this sound familiar? Where have you heard usability and accessibility? It's what you all do every single day. And that's what people like me, when I was working at the Smithsonian, we did it and I didn't even know it had a name for it. And that's actually um, a pretty cool story. I joined a mentoring program through IAGA. Any IAGA members here today? Yay! Um, I joined their mentoring program and one of the first things my mentor asked me was, what is your career narrative? And that's also a terrifying question because you're kind of looking back on all your career experiences and it's kind of like looking up at the stars and trying to make a constellation out of all these disparate stars that are in the sky. So I just kind of said, wow, what, what is my career narrative? And I said, you know what? Even though I'm new to UX design, I've been doing it for a while. So that's what the common thread is between everything that you're doing. You're keeping people first, you're keeping the user first, you're thinking of all these things as you're going along and developing. And even when I came up with programs at the Smithsonian, I had to keep all this in mind. So usability testing. Ours was very informal and it was done in such a way that we didn't even know that it was usability testing. 
And what we really counted on was visitor response. And sometimes the visitor response was, this is the best place I have ever been. My kids don't want to leave. I have to peel them off and get them out of here. And sometimes it's, eh, this was a cool place. It was all right. So, but we really needed to hear that because we wanted to know what programming was working in the space. So that was one of the easiest ways we got it. Another way that we got it was also from our staff response. Since we were always engaging the museum public, we knew what worked and what didn't work. If we made up a new program in the space, um, one of them was I came up with uh, taking red cabbage juice, boiling it down, and you can actually use it as a pigment that will tell you what liquids are an acid in a base. And I thought this was the most amazing thing. I did a research on it. I set it up. I took pictures. I was in the lab taking measurements. And the first time I facilitated the activity with kids, they were like, this is okay, can we see the dry ice again? And I was like, my feelings are hurt. So, but it was important that I got that feedback, knew what to change, and kind of put my feelings aside. So definitely the, huh? so definitely the staff uh, response from our docents was also important too. We had a docent staff of about what seemed to be maybe like 27 people. And since they were always around the museum, they told us what we needed to change within the space. And that was really important to get that kind of feedback. So supply usage. Um, one of the amazing programs we had in the space was build a robot arm. So it's kind of like transformers. Kids would, uh, we would provide them a, a table. It would have cardboard, it would have screws, it would have pipe cleaners mounds and mounds of construction paper, all different types of things, and they would make these contraptions and they would be walking around the space saying, I have a robot arm. It was so amazing. And the way that we knew that that was a popular space, because every day we went to that section of the space, it seemed like that stuff turned to vapors. It was completely missing by the end of the day. So we knew that since everybody used everything that was in that space, that's really popular. There were other things that were in the space that didn't work quite so well. The accompaniment to the build your own robot arms was actually a little um, area where you could sketch and brainstorm. So we would say, what does your robot want to look like? Like before you even build it, let's sketch and let's dream and imagine. And it took several iterations for us to kind of change the wording to really engage and be a, a step in the process that kids wanted to do. And we knew it didn't work because it was like piles of that left over by the end of the day. So we said, Man, Maybe this aspect of it isn't so popular. We changed the phrasing, made it more interactive, made it more engaging. Kids used it. Attendance levels. So every day in the space, uh, same time every day, every hour, we took a count. So we walked around. If you've ever gone to the museum, you might hear people going click, click, click when you walk past. That's their measurement of uh, how many people are circulating through the space. So I, the docents, other people in the space always took count of how many people were there. So that was a way that we tracked, um, just to see how many people were navigating through the space. We could also kind of get an idea of how long people were staying in the space. Sometimes we would get parents that they would literally park there and not leave for three hours. And we could tell that because we would do the count again. It was usually the same amount of people and they just never left. So the comparisons to what you guys do every day. User response, we see this guy, eh, he's kind of, but you need that. When you are doing your usability testing, I just did my first set of usability testing a month ago, and it was really interesting to see the facial response from people when they're um, being asked to do tasks that they can't do. All of that, you guys take that into consideration. Design issues, even when you're prototyping. I went to a great um, program yesterday by Ben Salinas, and he was talking about the frustrating, frustration that comes out of doing prototyping, and even yourself before you even get to maybe the, the uh, phase where you uh, release something for the client or out to the public, you interact with it, and you can even tell that it doesn't necessarily work, and you need to make changes. So you have to kind of listen to that as well. So, eye clicking and mouse track up. Uh, eye tracking and mouse clicks. So that's another way to, um, that you guys measure with uh, usability testing. And of course, web analytics, where I talked about the attendance levels. You guys track how many people are coming to the websites, how many people are using the mobile, uh, what types of platforms, if they're Mac people, if they're PC people, if many of your people are um, using mobile. I just worked on a project where almost all of our users were people that were using laptops or desktops. And it was because it was an older 
population that was using the website. So we had to keep that in mind where maybe we didn't have to necessarily do all the responsive designing. We didn't have to necessarily do a, a mobile site, maybe just make it a little friendly, but not deline uh, delineate a lot of time towards it because we didn't have to if most people weren't even utilizing that aspect of the design. So implementation, what would we do now that we've done the creation, we've uh, thought about our target market or different people like that, and now that we've actually tested it, how do we make changes? So oftentimes we had to reconfigure the space. We had to uh, move things around. We had to uh, make sure that, like I said, with accessibility, we had to make sure that persons that were in wheelchairs could reach the space and they could do the various activities. So we had to adjust. So we had to always constantly be changing all the program that we were giving in the space. And sometimes this meant that if we had uh, different types of initiatives that were going on in the Smithsonian, sometimes we had a food symposium. So we would actually adjust our programming that day to match what was going on in the space. When we worked with DARPA, that was uh, aligned with um, an initiative by the Smithsonian to teach about uh, robotics. So, Increase, what we'd have to do sometimes is increase staffing, make sure that all hands were on deck, all the, the docents were there, all staff members were there were to be, so that they could accommodate all the people that were inside of the space. There's nothing worse, I'm pretty sure you guys understand, than going somewhere and you can't find somebody that can help you. You can't find somebody that can help you get around. You can't uh, find what you need to find. So that's what we would make sure when you came to the museum, everybody was there to take care of you. And like I said, aligning with um, the initiatives of the Smithsonian, that's a lot of times what we had to take into consideration uh, with developing the programming as well. So the common thread that's kind of weaving all of this together is you guys work in UX. You have to have a certain personality that really gravitates toward this work. And I think what you need is compassion. You have to have understanding. You have to be have a willingness to really put yourself in other people's shoes. And that's what kind of parallels and, and holds together what I was doing at the Smithsonian and what you guys do uh, every day. So now I'm gonna take some questions and then we'll pick back up. So anybody have any questions right now? Yes. I'm wondering if you could talk about um, the committee of people you worked with in the beginning. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like something, you know, anything like that. Um, if you could talk a little bit about that process and um, what kind of disagreements you encountered there and how they were solved. Okay, that's a great question. So definitely, uh, it was a very receptive environment. I have to really give it to them. They really welcomed you, no matter if you were a docent, if you were kind of, you know, lower staff like myself, or if you were even you know, they would actually have the directors for the space come and work in the space. They had to once or twice a month. So everyone's op opinions were really respected. So one of the ways that we would do, we would kind of say, you know, in baseball, we would um, kind of compare it to a soft pitch and a strikeout. So one of the things we would say is, you know, I have an idea, let me take, let me take a hit at it. And they would say, okay, I'm listening. And if you had a good idea, they'd say, okay, I want you to kind of build on that and bring something to me, you know, kind of a, maybe a template or something that you want to do. And then we bring it to them, and nine times out of 10, they will let you do it, which is really awesome. So I think that um, a lot of the planning you needed to do was to also confer with um, conservationists within the museum, making sure we had the materials. You needed to um, do the budget, which I had to, to make sure that we could afford whatever program we wanted to do in the space. So those are all the things that we would do whenever we were planning different educational programming. So any other questions? Yes. When you do usability testing, an important part of it is defining the scenarios. Yes. Sure, that's a great question. One of the, um, with each setup that we had in there with, for example, Robbie the robot, our goal was to say, what are the top two things that kids can take away from using him? And we would say, okay, they need to understand that this is from DARPA, so at least if they could get an acronym down, they were good, and at least if they could say, he can see the ball, and when I move it, he's gonna follow using different types of tracking technology. That was literally our goal. 
because most people are kind of like goldfish. When they walk away from something after 10 minutes, they don't really remember. So that's how we would kind of set um, kind of the parameters of what we wanted to get out of this. So even though it was very informal, we just said if, if we can ask kids five minutes from now what they learned here and they can at least tell us, then this was a, a success. So those are the kinds of things that we would do. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Ford's Theater on Monday, and each level had a different emotional experience. Okay. And then you look at the monuments around here, like the Vietnam Memorial or the National Civil Rights Museum. Mm -hmm. uh, the National Civil Rights Museum is about um, the journey of civil rights, and it's about fear, mm -hmm. pity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Wow, that's a really good question. I think when it comes to the emotional design element, they really wanted you to take away um, inspiration, that you could be a designer, that you could be an inventor when you came into the space. Um, we had a Tesla coil, we had um, different items that talked about um, Thomas Edison, and we wanted to say, yes, these people have done great things, but you can do them too. So we really wanted to inspire and break down the invention process and say you need to sketch things, you need to prototype, you need to test them, you need to tweak them. So we really wanted to create an environment where people could feel inspired, like they have creative freedom, that they could try anything they wanted to, and if it didn't work, that's okay, just try something again, and that they could have fun. So I think that's definitely the emotional element that came out of the space, is just making sure that um, you felt inspired and that you could be an inventor. So that's really what we wanted to convey with the space. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you told us about one of your ideas that didn't yes. go as well as yes. you what, what did you consider to be your successful uh, ideas that you contributed? Oh wow, great, that's a good question. Um, one of the uh, really amazing things I did was, um, if you've ever been to the National Museum of American History, you'll know that we have the Star Spangled Banner. And what I actually came up with for a program was teaching people about the dye technology that went into uh, making the Star Spangled Banner. Um, at that time, dye technology was re relatively low to the earth. They would use mordants and dyes and different things to get indigo, to get reds. And since I have a background, I went to the School for Design, I knew about textiles. So I really took that project on to teach people that when you buy clothes now, they're all dyed by techno technologically manufactured dyes. But when you wanted to dye something in the 1800s, it was a very intensive process. So that's what I wanted to convey to them. So it actually worked out really good because I made a cart program where kids could like get to learn about the different dyes. They could feel the different materials. We also had um, kind of like a a microscope that's geared towards kids. So you would put it over and it would illuminate it on a giant television screen. So kids love using microscopes. They love seeing things like that. So that worked out really well um, in the space. So it traveled on a little cart and uh, we got to implement it. So that's one of my more successful things <laughs> that <laughs> worked within the space. And I kind of put the red cabbage in the recesses of my mind. So <laughs> yes, any more questions? Okay, well, that uh, wraps up my presentation. How, many, how much more time do I have? Oh, okay. Um, okay, so another thing I'd um, really like to talk with you guys about is within this space, when you're creating, you have to take so many considerations and think about a lot of things. But what I found about UX and even the work that I did at the Smithsonian is really the sky is the limit. And it's easy to kind of get kind of caught in dogma and say we have to adhere to all of these different things whenever we're creating. But one thing I guess I, I really do want you guys to take away from this is that you guys are doing great work. I just started doing it and I'm doing, uh, hope to do really good work with it as well. And I'm just really enjoying the creativity that comes from UX and really being able to to, to really just design things and be user focused and really say, what does this person need? What problem am I solving? And how can I put my imagination and my whimsical personality to the test and find out uh, how I can solve the problem? So, okay. That's really great. 
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. This is my first time.